Hello, this is Mark Tooley, president of the Institute on Religion and Democracy in Washington, D.C., and also editor of Providence, a journal of Christianity and American foreign policy. And today I have the great pleasure of talking to Dr. Glenn Lowry, professor of economics at Brown University in Providence, uh, Rhode Island, recently featured in a uh, wonderful uh, profile in the uh, Wall Street Journal and someone who is not averse to uh, controversy and ha who has much to say to our current uh, national moment. So uh, Glenn, thank you for joining this conversation. You're welcome, Mark. I'm very glad to be here. Uh, you can do it much better than I, but would you mind uh, summarizing um, who you are, your career, and your own uh, philosophical and spiritual trajectory, where you have landed? Okay, well, um, as you've mentioned, I'm Glenn Lowry. I'm an economist, a professor of economics at Brown University. I was baptized a born-again Christian at the age of 40 um, at the Bethel African Methodist Episcopal Church in uh, Boston. Um, I'm right of center politically relative to other academics uh, who uh, concern themselves with uh, race and inequality issues, which is one of my, one of my issues. Um, I have uh, been outspoken of late about uh, some of the problems that I see with the way that our national discourse is trending on questions of race, race and equity. Um, I call myself a contrarian uh, often for that. Um, in addition to teaching my classes and doing research, which I've been doing for 40 years, I completed my PhD at MIT in 1976. That's a long time ago. In addition to that, I'm a podcaster and I, I have a platform. I call it The Glenn Show um, at bloggingheads.tv, where I interview people and talk about issues of the day. So that's me. Well, um, we at IRD in Providence have been trying to find uh, thinkers and uh, writers who can address our current moment uh, theologically and spiritually, and often we've had a hard time doing so. Uh, many theologians and other religious thinkers seem to be just rehashing and echoing all of the other talking points that permeate our culture right now. So why are we in this uh, situation, and um, how should we be addressing our current uh, moment uh, more capably and more effectively? I think that's a hard question, Mark. And I want to say here at the outset that I um, am not any longer a practicing Christian, actually. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a uh, apostate. Um, I'm, I've lost my way, a person might say. I've, I, I've had a struggle with faith issues that goes back uh, a while. And if you were interested, we could talk about that. But I want to try to respond to your question about the moment. Uh, I, I simply say that I don't regard myself speaking with theological authority as I now respond to your question. Um, here's what I think is going on. Uh, I think that we have failed uh, as a country to uh, make the best of the transition, the transformation in the structures of American society that occurred between the Second World War and the end of the Vietnam War, 1945 to 1975. I just, that's an arbitrary time bracketing, but um, monumental shifts in the structure of American society regarding the status of African Americans and um, equality of opportunity and so forth occurred in that period of time. There were changes of law, but there was also changes of social norm and attitude. And um, we've made some errors. Uh, I think that the result of that failure, and there's enough blame to go around, um, I think there are failures within African-American leadership and society. Um, I, I think there are failures within the Democratic Party. Um, I think there are failures within the conservative movement. Um, I think there are failures of governance in the large urban areas. I mean, you know, there's a lot of blame to go around. I think educational institutions in the main that serve the least advantaged of our population haven't really performed in the way that we would hope. I think that our reaction to the problem of maintaining order in society, I'm talking about law, crime, punishment, policing, drug war, et cetera, et cetera, 
hasn't always been wise and has at times been excessively punitive and at times has been excessively lenient and at times has been, you know, um, a, a kind of futile effort to, uh, you know, control aspects of social behavior like drug use that are probably best treated therapeutically and not punitively and so on. So uh, there's plenty of failure, and I'm, I'm just touching on the things that occur to me right now. There's plenty of failure to go around. The bottom line is that 30% oh, or so, a third of the African-American population that you will find um, overrepresented in the prisons and on the welfare rolls and in the public housing projects and uh, in, the, uh, in the corners of society uh, haven't really been incorporated into the amazing engine of opportunity, which is the American political economy. Uh, we still have pockets of, uh, of, of America that are like another America. This was Michael Harrington in the 1960s talking about poverty in America, and we still have exclusion, we still have marginalization. We certainly do see it in our prisons um, and uh, in our streets. Um, and we have allowed uh, the discussion about these issues in the mainstream venues of public deliberation to be dominated by, um, uh, well, you know, two different strains of thought, I think. One of them, uh, you know, that is dismissive of uh, the folks who suffer these conditions and you know, uh, re relatively indifferent to their plight. I, I, I don't mean to cast dispersions, but, but I think it's fair to say that, uh, you know, people who complain about um, anti-Black racism and so on are, are, are not making it all up, and that some of the uh, right wing of American politics really is, you know, relatively hostile or indifferent to the aspirations. I think that's probably a not inaccurate thing to say, but it's not the main thing in my view. The other piece of it is that the left uh, have evolved, and we see it now most recently in these um, uh, public demonstrations and the things that are being written in the in the media and the things that uh, people who have positions like mine in the academy, especially in the uh, liberal precincts are, are saying, um, they've elaborated a, a, a theory of the case that is, that is getting things completely wrong. Uh, they don't talk about values. They don't talk about families. They don't talk about behavior. They don't talk about norms. They, they don't talk about responsibility. They don't talk about duty in reference to African Americans. They talk about systemic racism. They talk about structural racism. They talk about white supremacy. This has become a kind of pseudo religion um, and they enact these rituals of, uh, uh, you know, uh, guilt and shame and reparation, which don't address the underlying, uh, uh, the underlying realities that are uh, desperately in need of being addressed. So what, what am I talking about? So two and three black kids are raised by a mother without a husband present. It's become impossible to even call attention to this fact in reference to any kind of social problem in certain quarters of society. You will be presumptively dismissed as a racist. So the homicide rate that affects African Americans is an order of magnitude higher than that that affects other Americans. The level of violence in some of these communities in Baltimore and St. Louis and Chicago and Philadelphia in New York City and other places that one could name, the level of violence is unspeakable. And yet there is barely a murmur outside of uh, Fox News, Sean Hannity types, barely a mention of it. The suffering, the human suffering attendant to this slaughter that is ongoing. Um, I didn't use the words black on black crime. Of course, it is mostly crime committed by black people against other black people. I don't regard that as the most important thing. They're people first. Their blackness isn't especially significant in the context of what I'm saying here, except that it stands at the end of a long historical development that I'm trying to give some description of. But the level of suffering, I mean, the funerals that people are having, I mean, the memorials that are being, shrines that are being uh, spontaneously stood up in memory of these 16 or 18 or 
22 year old young people who have been gunned down. Uh, the pathos, the loss, the agony. Um, and yet I see barely any reflection of that in the popular media. I see very, very, very little attention in the people who write the scripts for the movies that are made in Hollywood and the people who write the op-ed pieces for the major newspaper organs and such, the people who decide who comes on uh, cable television to talk about the events of the day, the political candidates and parties, um, especially left of center, uh, don't attend to this. So I'm, I, I don't want to ramble here too long. What I'm trying to say is I think we've lost our way. There is failure. There is the stench of failure in the air. And uh, people don't quite know what to do about it. They're false gods. I use the words advisedly, but I mean those words. They're false gods have failed them. Uh, they look now for uh, uh, a mobilization against racism to solve all of these problems. Uh, and it's not going to, it's not going to happen. Um, so I think there's frustration. I think there's anger. I think there's rage. There are many, many dimensions of this. Let me just mention one. So we're, we're now in uh, higher education, uh, locked into the affirmative action regime in which, uh, you know, uh, highly competitive positions, which are generally awarded only to people who exhibit, um, you know, excellence at the right tail of the distribution of human performance. I'm talking about, you know, getting into one of these universities and so forth. They're being allocated to uh, what they call, what they call people of color. We could interrogate this language, but let's not waste our time. Let's just go with the language. Are being allocated uh, on different criteria. You don't have to have the same level of excellence in order to get in. You, you've got a lower standard. That's just a fact. It's an institutionalized fact of the way that business is practiced. Now, beneath that fact is the reality that while the test scores and other criteria that you use to select people are not a, you know, they're not a window on the soul, they're not a Rosetta Stone, they don't tell us exactly what a human's potential are, are nevertheless informative about how people are going to perform. So it's predictable that if you select from the right tail of the distribution of human performance into some uh, uh, activity that requires virtuosity. And if you use different criteria for selecting people of color and others, uh, that you're going to get different performance after the fact of selection on the average in these populations. Otherwise, why would you have used the test scores and the grades as the criteria of selecting anybody in the first place? So now we have the difference in performance. I'm just going to say it flatly. What we have at elite institutions where affirmative action has become institutionalized is on average difference in the rate of performance of the students who have been selected into these venues. Not every single student, but on average. And it's an inescapable statistical necessity that this be true because we're using different criteria and the criteria that we use are correlated with performance after the fact. So now what do we do? Do we uh, uh, institute remediation? Do we acknowledge the difference in performance? Do we give honest grades? Do, do we flunk people out when they don't quite cut, you know, you could say give people a chance, but if they don't measure up, no, that's not what we do. We lower the standards, we obfuscate, we lie. We say there are no differences in performances there. Uh, when uh, law professor Amy Wax of the University of Pennsylvania said on my podcast three years ago that in her experience in the law school at the University of Pennsylvania, which is an elite law school, in her first year classes that the black students on the whole were not doing that well. She was set upon by uh, Twitter mobs, people demanding her head on a platter. The dean of the law school suspended her from teaching the required first year course that she'd been teaching for many years because he said the students of the school should not be required to present themselves before a professor who would dare say something like that. Now, what did she say? She simply stated a fact. She stated a fact about the performance of students in her school, a fact which is predictable, given that the law school admits students of color with a different criteria. You would expect that they might not write as well. They might not uh, be as, uh, as competitive in the classroom if they came in with lower LSAT scores and, and less uh, distinguished uh, college records. So, so we, we now have a regime where, <laughs> Simply reporting the facts about student performance is met not with a slap on the forehead, oh my God, what have we done? 
look at the situation we've created for ourselves, how shall we really be it, but rather with a denial of the facts and an effort to excommunicate the person who brought them to our attention. And this is just one of many things that I could say. The jails are overflowing with young black men in this country. Perhaps our sentences are too long. Perhaps there shouldn't be a drug war. Perhaps you should decriminalize some things. Perhaps, perhaps, perhaps. But the fact of the matter is that the jails are overflowing in part because too many of these young black men are committing offenses against society that requires some kind of punitive re response. Where is the discussion of that? I can recall, and I'll stop, uh, not long ago when Obama was president, the Department of Education sent around a, a letter, practically a directive to local school districts telling them that if they were suspending black kids at a higher rate than white kids, they were in danger of losing their federal funds because they were uh, presumptively practicing discrimination in school discipline. Nowhere in the letter is the possibility entertained that for a variety of reasons that we could spend a long time talking about, including those fathers who are not present in those homes, the behavior patterns of some kids of color in some schools were disruptive and needed to be dealt with through discipline. Nowhere do they entertain the possibility that the problem might not be racism of the school, but the problem might be the, the uh, fact that kids are coming without the social discipline, some of them from some of the homes, uh, which causes them to be disruptive and they, they then have to be, uh, they have to be dealt with because of that disruption. I, I'm not making an argument for suspension as such. I'm saying that the alarm bell to the, from the racial disparity might have been different development of our youngsters requiring us to focus on the root cause of their behavioral uh, uh, problem. It might have been that, but instead, reflexively, the reaction was, and this uh, order, by the way, has been rescinded by Betsy DeVos at uh, the Education Department under President Trump. It might have been, uh, this is a uh, canary in the coal mine kind of thing. You know, the, the disruptive behavior of these kids in school is a indicator of uh, problems of social development in some communities that require to be addressed on their own account and blaming the school district for the fact that it has to deal with kids who are disruptive is uh, not exactly being honest about what the problem is. But anyway, uh, here's what I think and I'll, and I'll stop. I think we, we've talked ourselves into uh, a corner here um, it becomes impossible to actually address the substantive functional root of some of the racial inequality. All racial inequality has to be a result of a failed system. And so the, the natural uh, concomitant of such an intellectual predisposition is for rank and file people in the streets confronted with the realities of such inequality, which will sometimes uh, result in incidents like the one that uh, led to the killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis, Minnesota a couple of months ago, uh, that those realities lead to uh, people uh, acting in the way that they have acted, reacting in the way that they have reacted. I'm only telling one side of the story. I'm not explaining why it is that um, uh, perfectly um, comfortable and relatively secure whites would uh, be kneeling down and uh, begging black people to forgive them for racism for 400 years. I, uh, that's a psychological problem that I'm probably not the best person to try to, maybe you can explain that to me. I, I, <laughs> I understand that. But, but I think on the, on the side of the activists and the anti-racists uh, uh, from uh, the African-American community, a lot of it is a frustration at the bitter fruit of a half century of incomplete and inadequate incorporation of African-Americans into the body politic here and into the political economy, some of which I think uh, has to be laid, some of the responsibility for which has to be laid at the feet of African-Americans ourselves. So is a crux of the issue at hand, basically a uh, overwhelming denial of personal responsibility and replacing it with uh, an almost exclusive focus on systemic and institutional injustice? I think so. Uh, certainly from the point of view of the well-being of African-American people, I believe this is a fundamental issue. I've written about this. My pithy way of putting it is nobody is coming to save us. Okay. What I say to fellow African-Americans when I'm talking about this issue and I'm trying to exhort people to think about personal and communal responsibility is that 
it's a fool's errand to at one and the same time point your finger at the man, the white man, white society, whatever that means, and to say you're racist. And yet, at the other, on the other hand, expect that they're going to somehow deliver you from the circumstances into which you have fallen. I mean, you ask your oppressor, your, your, your petition is to your oppressor to stop being racist. If only we could have a conversation about race. That, that seems, uh, uh, you know, delusional uh, to me. Um, but moreover, I also argue that much of what needs to be done, like raising our children, can't be done by anybody other than the community itself. There's no social program that's going to substitute for uh, a wholesome environment in which uh, children are taught, uh, socialized into, inspired, equipped uh, to be successful in life. So, um, yeah, I think a big part of the problem is a presumption that uh, the, the locus of uh, the difficulty lies with outside of the individual and the community and the um, uh, demand, and then that's how it's being phrased now. It's, it's a demand, we demand. We demand that there be more black professors at Brown. We demand that there be fewer people in prison. We demand that income and wealth be more equal. We demand, we demand. As if wealth fell from the sky, as if wealth and equality were simply the fact that some people got it and some people didn't. What about creating wealth? What about starting businesses? What about taking risks? What about saving? What, what about cultivating the habits of mind and of practice that are associated with success? Um, no one can do that for you. Uh, of course, uh, no, we, we're not islands here. We're not individuals isolated one from another. Of course, there are responsibilities in any decent society to provide a basic safety net and a structure of opportunity for people, including those who are most disadvantaged. But nobody can teach your kid to read. No, no, no one can make sure that the kid is at, at 10 o'clock at night, is at home in a safe place rather than wandering the streets. No one can guarantee that the child is going to do his homework for you and if you're not paying attention to what the child is doing. No one can supervise who he's spending his time with or she that might be a bad influence and so on. Um, there's a lot of responsibility that falls on the shoulders of uh, we African Americans, which I think people are loath to assume. Is America systemically racist currently? And if so, what does that mean exactly? I have no idea what it means. I, again, I, I spend my time these days writing pieces and giving interviews and speeches where I say, I don't know what you're talking about when you say systemic racism. Could you please be more specific? Now, if they had said, America is a capitalist society, I'm a Marxist, and I think that the search for profit is inevitably going to impoverish the working man and uh, leave the fat cats better off, I would have at least understood what they were saying, okay? Because that's a well-developed doctrine. It's not a doctrine of Marxism that I embrace, but it's a well-developed, perfectly intellectually coherent doctrine. When people say structural racism, I have no idea what they're talking about. I think I know what they mean though. They mean shut up. When they say structural racism, what they mean is stop blaming the victim. Uh, what, what they mean is, uh, you know, don't talk to me about their behavior, uh, you know, what they mean is, it's your fault, not my fault, it's your fault. It sometimes said in precisely that trembling uh, tone of voice. Um, I think I could probably give a more sympathetic account of what they mean. They mean that race emerges out of a history of slavery and domination of African Americans, which in this country of the land of the free and the home of the brave and you know, all persons created equal and endowed with their creator with certain inalienable rights could only have happened by constructing the image of the Negro, of the Black, of the colored as uh, somehow less than fully equal. They had to be seen as less than human to, to enslave them while at the same time signing off on the Declaration and all of that. And that that history got itself insinuated into the bone and the sinew and the texture, the structure of American life and has carried itself forward even to this day so that the uh, fact of slavery, the fact of Jim Crow segregation, of de jure segregation, of uh, Amos and Andy and Step and Fetch It and all of the stigmatizing images of Blacks, that fact still exists in the interstices of American society. It's still somehow exerting itself. Um, 
I think, you know, you can find evidence, you know, you're going to find racist police departments. Uh, you're going to find legislatures that, you know, legislators who have given speeches in which they've said this. You're going to find political campaigns in which uh, dog whistle racial epithets might be or, or insinuations might be communicated. Uh, you're going to find segregated cities. You're going to find businesses that have relatively few Blacks in the front office and so on. Some of this will be a reflection of discrimination. Much of it, I dare say today in the year 2020, most of it will be a reflection of the fact that people, groups of people are different in their skills and aptitudes. Uh, you don't see the NFL or the NBA looking like America. It looks like the people who are best at the things that they champion. Um, there's no reason I should think why every venue of American society necessarily has to have a demographic composition that's perfectly reflective of the population. But I think what they mean is that America is somehow permanently tainted by this history. Uh, and the history accounts for the unevenness of uh, opportunity and of success that we observe by racial categories today. Frankly, I must say, as a social scientist, I think it's a very thin argument. I, I think it's more wishful. Uh, people just assert that there's a connection. So how do you explain the condition of the African-American family, assuming that you're willing to talk about it at all? I, I'm talking about those, uh, you know, two and three kids born to a woman without a husband. I'm not necessarily making a moral judgment here, wagging my finger at the woman that she doesn't have a husband and she has a child. That's not my point. My point is that the developmental consequences of family structure of that sort could be very profound it might have a lot to do with some of the difficulties that we see in terms of indisciplined um, adolescent males in the cities getting themselves into trouble. How do you explain that based on structural racism? I suppose you can make an argument, but it's not a very serious historical and sociological argument, it seems to me. Um, how do you explain that uh, non-white, non-Blacks who come to the country, some of them with very little, uh, are nevertheless able, many, to penetrate into all of the venues of American life with relative success uh, and African-Americans lag behind. I suppose you could say, oh, well, they're different. They're not whites, but they're also not blacks. And there's a special stigma that attacks, attaches to anti-black racism and so forth and so on. But the arguments look pretty thin to me. So, so I, I think it's a, it's, it's a rhetorical, uh, I've said this in something I wrote recently, I think the use of structural racism is a rhetorical move. It, it's not a social scientific move at all. They, they don't really intend to explain anything. Uh, they're trying to control the conversation by placing blame on people who uh, don't see the world the way that they do. You mentioned uh, white people on their knees uh, pleading for forgiveness. Aren't we in part witnessing uh, the attempted uh, construction of a, a new religion that uh, in part echoes Christianity, it wants uh, repentance, it wants uh, atonement, but there seems to be no forgiveness there or, or uh, any ultimate culmination to this cycle. Yeah, well, I, I remember enough about Christianity to know that this ain't Christianity. <laughs> but it does have quasi-religious aspects to it. It does seem to me it has its rituals. It hunts for heretics and apostates. Uh, it's got a catechism. It's got a party line. Uh, my uh, my uh, conversation partner and my podcast, uh, John McWhorter, is given often to using this religion metaphor in reference to the the, the mania of uh, anti the crusade against racism, the anti racist. Um, I don't like the metaphor because I think it's a it, it's a discredit to religion to to compare religion to uh, to to these people. I, I think it doesn't take religion seriously. Uh, religion is not just the rote recitation of a mantra. Religion is not just the blind following of whatever the doctrine is that's handed down. Religion is not only or even mainly hunting for people who don't believe so that you can call them out and cancel them. Uh, so, you know, uh, but yeah, that there is a, there is a, uh, uh, it, it, an aspect. I mean, it, it, it feels a little bit more to me like uh, hunting for witches. I don't know if you call that religion. Is Salem religion? You know, uh, burning people at the stake. Is that religion? I, I, you know, it, it does have connections to some religious movements that have lost their way, but it's not the heart and soul of religion, I would say. 
Your uh, colleague you just mentioned, uh, McWhorter, uh, wrote a, a very powerful uh, critique in Atlantic of uh, a very popular book right now called uh, White Fragility. Yeah, I saw it. Is there anyone out there writing good things on this topic right now? Oh, yeah, I think so. Um, I even think there are people in the on the left who are writing good things. I'm even. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't put it that way, but there are there are people who I, I think so I'll name one. He's not on the left. His name is Thomas Chatterton Williams. He's a, a writer, um, a young African American writer, book called Losing My Cool, which is a memoir of his growing up in um, uh, in his uh, late teens and twenties and fighting his way out of the mind ghetto of uh, black teenage culture into the big broad world. He lives in France now. He's a fluent French speaker. He's traveled the world. He's a cosmopolitan. But he began with this very narrow kind of hip hop centered uh, kind of social life. And he, you know, he describes how he grew out of that. Um, he happens to be um, uh, biracial. His mother is white. His father is black. And he's married to a French woman. I guess that counts as white. So he's written a book called uh, uh, what does he call it? Uh, uh, overcoming race. Sorry, you guys are gonna have to look it up. Uh, but escaping race, but that's that's not the title. But it's something like that. And he basically poses the question: Is my daughter black? His daughter, whose mother is white, whose both of whose grandmothers are white. She has three or four grandparents who were white. She has curly hair and light, light, light brown skin. And, you know, she could be Italian, she could be Spanish, you know, she could be a lot of things. But the first thing of, that you think of is not to call her black because she doesn't look like that. And he's at, in a, he goes through a kind of uh, agonizing reflection about uh, identity because he wants his daughter to be, he thinks he wants his daughter to be black. He starts out thinking, he wants his daughter to be black. And then he realizes, what am I doing to my daughter? What, why am I imposing this binary categorization on her? Uh, out of what reason, of what commitments am I, am I doing this? Why is this necessary? He begins to ask and he, he develops a whole book. Um, Unlearning, Unlearning Race is the name of this book. It's brilliant in my opinion. Uh, he's a very thoughtful guy. He, by the way, uh, this is just apropos of nothing in particular, but he was one of the driving forces behind the Harper's letter, this famous letter mm -hmm. published a few days ago, mm -hmm. maybe a week ago, that uh, collects signatures from uh, many, many, many prominent um, American writers to decry the cancel culture that's emerged in uh, progressive circles for people who don't entirely hew to the party line you know, an editor at uh, New York Times Magazine being forced out because he ran an op-ed piece from Senator Tom Cotton making an argument that you can agree or disagree with, but it's a perfectly reasonable thing to say. If the local authorities can't keep the peace in the cities, we need to bring in the feds. Now, I'm not saying I agree or I disagree with that, but there's nothing crazy about that. That's a thought that a person could have. You could make an argument about why that may or may not be a good idea. A newspaper runs a sitting American senator's article and people in the newsroom have a fit because it takes the wrong position. It agrees with President Donald Trump about something. How dare you do that? You know, and uh, uh, this guy is out. He's out. And there are many like him who are out. You know, the editor at uh, the New York Review of Books, Ian Baruma, gave a space in the magazine for someone who had been um, uh, me tooed, a guy that had been you know, uh, uh, defenestrated because he had ran across some line. And the guy had a story. He had, he had a, there was another side. He wanted to tell his side. Ian Baruma gives him space in the New York Review of Books to tell his side. The next thing you know, he's out. Baruma is out as editor at the New York Review of Books because how dare he give time to a, a rapist, quote unquote, to, uh, to write in the magazine. There, there are many, many examples of this. And Thomas and a number of others have had enough of it and they put a letter out. Anyway, so you ask me where there are people, he's one of them I would name McWhorter. There are others. There's the young Coleman Hughes, just graduated from Columbia University uh, with a degree in philosophy. We're gonna be hearing a lot from him. He's extremely talented, intelligent, uh, passionate, courageous, 
uh, the uh, YouTube video of him debating with ta Coates about reparations before the U.S. House of Representatives is priceless. It's already got, I don't know, a quarter million views, but it should have 250 million views if you ask me, because that's just a very important issue and Coleman is, is saying things to my mind that are very, very sensible about it. There are others. Um, well, Dr. Glenn Lowry, Professor of Economics at Brown University, thank you very much for a fascinating and provocative conversation, and uh, we'll be praying that you get back to church soon sometime. Thanks. Have me back, and I'll, I'll tell you my story. Maybe you can save me, man. It's not too late. Okay. I'd love to do that. <laughs> I'll insist that we do that sometime soon. Okay, Mark. Thank you, Glenn.